So today I'm going to talk about why there were two revolutions in Russia in 1917. Um, so the way I'm going to approach this question is I'm going to start by trying to outline what we mean by power and authority in 1917 um, and what dual power meant, because dual power is something that's very important for um, our understanding of 1917. It's something that comes up a lot in historical writing on 1917. Um, so I'm going to start by just outlining power and authority and dual power. Then I'm going to go on and I'm going to talk about three key issues. Those three key issues, bread, land and peace. And these are the three things, I think, that we can really pull out from 1917 to say, well, what are, what are the big problems? What are the real issues for anybody trying to govern Russia in 1917? So I'm going to start then by talking about power and authority because revolution... Um, is it, a lot of revolution is about well who's controlling power and who has authority. And the difficulty here is that it's very difficult to um, to really put a put a finger on where the power really lies. So um, in February 1917, with the um, the February Revolution in Petrograd and the rise of the Provisional Government, who took power in Petrograd, um, they took power officially and formally, but. Did they have power? Now, what, what makes power? I think what makes power is the support of the military, first, always important. You've got to have support of the military. If you don't have support of the military, then you're not able to um, back up your decisions. So that's one area of power. Another area of power, though, is very difficult to define, and that's popular support. How important is popular support in political power? I mean, how do, how do we define this? So, when it comes to political power, and, and popular support, this is not necessarily a direct connection. We can, have, um, uh, we can have bodies who are not very popular controlling political power. Alternatively, we can have bodies which are brought to power on the back of enormous popular support. The provisional government, I think, falls somewhere between these two stools in that it, it emerged as a result of massive popular unrest and unrising, particularly the revolt of the Petrograd garrison in February of 1917. But um, its, its base of popular support was then challenged by the Petrograd Soviet. So what was the Petrograd Soviet and what is its relationship to the provisional government? The Petrograd Soviet set up in order to um, present a popular representation for Petrograd's uh, initially just Petrograd workers, but then Petrograd's workers and soldiers. It eventually came to represent Petr uh, the, the, uh, the workers, soldiers and peasants of Russia. So it became an incredibly important body. But initially it was just set up to uh, represent Petrograd's workers. And this body, which formed alongside the provisional government, came to um, attract a lot of popular support initially just in the capital, um, but quickly it attracted popular support across Russia. So this body then has a degree of authority because it has popular support. The provisional government has official power, but not necessarily much in the way of popular support, not in the way that we're talking about with the, with the Petrograd Soviet. So this is one of the problems we have for the provisional government in 1917, that it it has political power, but it doesn't necessarily have the level of support it requires. And then the Petrograd Soviet is a body which is set up alongside it, which is attracting popular support, and which in many cases is looked to as an alternative form of government. So that's the starting point, but who wants power? The provisional government was a reluctant holder of power in 1917. They took it on because somebody had to, because Russia's government collapsed when these are um, abdicated in February 1917. So what are we left with? Um, the provisional government, which came from the state Duma, was, uh, was trying to hold Russia together until the establishment of full, free, fair elections that could um, elect a constituent assembly in Russia, which didn't actually happen until November of 1917. Um, so they, they, they used power, but they weren't necessarily very keen on power. The Petrograd Soviet, we would, we would expect maybe they wanted power. They didn't want power, absolutely not. The Petrograd Soviet stepped back from any um, attempt to hold power early in 1917. Um, because the Petrograd Soviet's leaders believed that it was necessary for the revolution to develop in the hands of the provisional government in a so-called bourgeois government in order for the development of the revolution towards its ultimate socialist phase. 
So that's the that's the idea with the with the Petrograd Soviet's leaders. This changes in the course of 1917 as the Bolshevik leaders become increasingly important and authoritative in the Petrograd Soviet. But we need to emphasize that, generally speaking, the leaders within the Petrograd Soviet did not want power. Um, Lenin alone was the only man who actively asserted his desire to take power in 1917, in the early stages of 1917. So here's the background then for the provisional government in 1917, that we have a conflict between power and authority. They have political power, but not political authority necessarily, political authority as it stems from popular support. So there's the problem for the, for the provisional government. But what's this dual power thing about? So dual power is the phrase which is used to describe the feeling in Russia in 1917 that there were actually two um, sources of power, that is the provisional government and the Petrograd Soviet. And it's commonly been argued that this dual power worked in practice, that the Petrograd Soviet had some power and had to work to some extent against the provisional government in 1917. Um, and there is some evidence to support that idea. So the Soviet, um, in certain instances, countermands decrees that have been put out by the provisional government. Um, the Soviet, most importantly, I think, holds sway in the military, and the military is without doubt the most important source of power within any, um, within any state, but particularly within a revolutionary state. Um, we also see that the Soviet's role in October, when the Bolsheviks seized power, is significant. Um, and, I mean, finally, I would say, in, in support of the idea that there was dual power, there is this, uh, I mean, very... Um, well established in the press, this idea that there was a split in Russia between the so-called democratic and non-democratic forces. Now, when we talk about democracy in 1917, we're not talking about it in the terms that um, we might understand it, that is, full free fair elections, everybody gets an equal right to vote. What we're really talking about is the democracy, the so-called um, you know, the, the working classes really is what's meant by the democracy, the normal people against the elites, against the so-called bourgeoisie. So there is a sense of division in Russia in 1917 between the ordinary people, the so-called democracy, and the um, elites, the bourgeoisie. Um, and so some people have argued that the provisional government and the Petrograd Soviet represent a split between um, the democratic and the non-democratic forces in Russia. So there's another argument for the idea that there was a sense of dual power in 1917. On the other hand, though, there are some, um, some arguments which suggest that there wasn't really dual power acting in Russia in 1917. And this is the one I probably support more, actually. First, when we look at the positions of the Petrograd um, Soviet and the provisional government on a lot of key questions, on, for example, the war, on um, land questions, on food, the things I'm going to talk about later, we find that they're, they're, they're common, they share the same ideals, they share the desire for Russia to avoid civil war, they share the desire for Russia to have um, full, fair, free elections, to produce a constituent assembly which will be Russia's rightful ruling body. Um, the Soviet doesn't challenge the provisional government in general, rather it tends to support it. So. This is a slightly different angle on the same, the same question. I mean, also, the Soviet's leaders resisted mass demands that they seize power from the provisional government. Again, an indication that the Soviet and the provisional government were working much more closely than you might have expected. So that's my outline, really, my background to the problems that the provisional government faced in 1917 in terms of power relations and their relationship with the uh, Petrograd Soviet. I'm now going to go on and talk about what I think are the three big issues, the big problems for the provisional government. So I'm going to give you the big problems, bread, land and peace. I'm going to tell you what the problems were, and then I'm going to tell you what the provisional government tried to do about them. So, I mean, it's, it's clear, really, from the outcome that the provisional government didn't solve these problems. These were their big issues. They didn't work out. Um, so I'm going to try and see, well, what did they do wrong? Could they have done anything better? And then at the end, we're going to look at how the Bolsheviks tackled these problems. So you're probably aware of this, but bread, land and peace was the key slogan of the Bolshevik party. It was one of the things that swept them into power in October of 1917. They promised the answer to the big questions. Can they deliver? So let's start by looking at what these problems were. Let's start with bread. So 
What was the problem with bread and grain supply in Russia in 1917? Well, it's a difficult one, actually, because um, Russia was a big grain exporter pre, pr prior to the First World War. Russia shouldn't have had any problem at all feeding herself because she'd been a massive a seller of grain to the rest of the world. So what went wrong? Well, the first thing that went wrong is that the demands of the army on the food supply system were very, very great. So Russia had a massive standing army, up to around 14 million men were mobilised, and these 14 million men needed to be fed by the state. And the state fed these men, but this uh, took grain away from the um, ordinary distribution networks and made it more difficult for um, the urban populations of Russia to acquire grain, to acquire the necessary amount of grain that was required to feed them. Um, so that's one problem. Um, the next, uh, another of the big problems was in uh, the transportation and distribution of grain in Russia in 1917. So we know that Russia was a vast empire. This was a landmass, not just a country. Um, and the distances required to move grain from the producing areas to the hungry areas were very significant. Now, ordinarily, this wouldn't be a problem. However, in 1917, because of the strain of the war on Russia's um, transport network, th this um, made it very, very difficult for the, co the government and for private producers to move grain from one place to the next and then to distribute this grain fairly to various um, urban centres. So this is one of the problems we face, it's just moving and getting grain to where it needs to be. Because of course some parts of Russia produced lots of grain, and some parts of Russia didn't produce any grain at all, so they needed to move these products from one place to the next. I think one of the biggest issues of course, and this is the, probably the one you're most familiar with, is the problem of the collapse of internal markets however. What happens is that in 1914, Russia's economy went on to a war footing, and that meant that all the, um, the pr goods that were usually produced for the domestic market, like, oh, I don't know, sickles, um, matches, bits and bobs for the home, textiles for, for daily wear, all these kind of ordinary things that people might want to buy are no longer available because the factories that made them have been turned over to war production. So the place that used to make nice little rubber boots that are handy if you're out in the countryside um, is now making galoshes for the army. So the state begin, be, becomes the big buyer. It is controlling and, 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 and capitalising on all the different e economies within... Uh, with, sorry, it's capitalising on all the different industries within Russia. And this means that an internal market is not allowed to develop. So if you are an ordinary peasant fellow in Russia... Um, and you've developed, you've, you've grown grain, who are you going to sell your grain to and what are you going to do with your cash? Now, if the, um, if the internal markets have collapsed and there's no cloth to buy, there's no boots to buy, there's no way you can get the equipment that you need, what are you going to do with cash? You're not going to bank it. So what actually happens is that with the collapse of the internal markets, it becomes increasingly difficult to um, persuade peasant producers to sell their grain because they, they don't have a lot of incentive to do that. Instead of selling their grain, they're more likely to eat more, they're more likely to brew alcohol with grain, So another thing that happens, they feed their animals better. So what we see actually in the war years in some regions is that people are eating better, they're drinking more alcohol and their animals are fatter, but they're not selling grain. And this is a big problem for a country. Um, which is at war, which needs to feed its cities. It's the cities that are most likely to be hungry. Although in some rural areas that don't produce grain, they're also hungry. So it's not just an urban-rural thing, but most often you see the conflict between rural areas and urban areas. Um, also, another problem we've got for grain production. We've got the problem of a lower sown area in the countryside. Now remember I mentioned earlier that 14 million men were mobilised for the First World War in Russia. These men had lives before they were soldiers. These men, were, were a lot of them, were tilling the land. They were peasants. Um, without their labour, you've lost all the men, age 18 to 45, just about. They've gone. So what happens in the countryside, in the villages, is the elderly, women and children are left trying to till the land. And remember that grain production in Russia at the beginning of the 20th century was still very much a hands-on um, enterprise. This is not highly mechanised, so you need bodies 
to do hard physical labour, and with the loss of the young and middle-aged men who went off to be soldiers, what are you going to do? What happens is that the sown areas shrink, so the amount of, of land that people are uh, tilling is reduced, which means that there's less grain produced, which means it's harder again to get that grain to the cities. So that's the background of the problem in grain. There's no food coming to, well, there's not enough food coming to the country, coming from the countryside to the cities. So what can any government do about that? This is a problem that had been brewing, actually, not just in 1917, but in, from 1914 onwards. This is something which had been developing. So the provisional government didn't pr produce this problem. They didn't create it. They just had to deal with it. So how do they deal with it? What do they try to do?